Hi, I'm Anna McNaught. Let me show you how to go from this starting image to this final result in just a few steps. Welcome Let's get to started. Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers, episode 166. <laughs> Today we're going to be looking a little bit of kind of slight return to cinematic photography. Um, some of you may remember a few weeks ago or maybe a couple of months ago now, um, I did a shoot with Annalise and Phil uh, where we kind of sort of did quite a sort of cinematic look to it. Anyway, on the same day we did an entirely different shoot um, and it's taken me a while to get around to processing the photos and finding a different style of editing that I wanted to do. So that's what I'm planning on sharing with you today. Also, Janet sent in an image for uh, some feedback. So here we are live on YouTube. Make sure you uh, leave me a message, um, say hi, tell me where you're from, tell me what the weather's doing, and I'll see you in a moment. So yes, welcome. So here we are live on YouTube, unless you happen to be watching the recording. Either way, make sure you subscribe, click the like button down there as well. That always helps the algorithms. Um, and yes, leave me a message. Say hi. I can see we've got a couple of people in already. Maggie says hello from a sunny and warm Castle Douglas. And it is indeed a sunny and warm Castle Douglas, which is rather lovely. Um, Stacy says good morning. Beautiful sunny morning here. As in um, Pennsylvania. Uh, we'll be in the 80s. Labor Day weekend here. Um, Nadia says hello from a sunny Fife. Sandra says hello everyone from a sunny Birmingham. Susan says hello everyone from a beautifully warm and sunny Kukubri. Um, Robert says howdy all from Texas, though he doesn't say whether it's sunny or not. And Andy says hello from Bishop Stortford. Excellent. Right, okay, so, so far the uh, weather's looking good around the world. <laughs> So yes, today then, today we're going to be looking at um, a set of photos I did with Annalise and Phil. And uh, so some of you, like I say, may, may remember some of the ones that I did before. And um, so, well, I did, I, the set that I did before, it was a kind of very intense emotional set that was done in a bathroom. Um, but I also did another one. Do you remember when I, again, several months or two back now, um, or a couple of months back, I did, I did a kind of um, inspired by Wes Anderson style photo. And uh, let me just see if I can find that and pull that one up for you. Um, so yeah, th this one. So some of you may remember this one. So at this point, this was just one of the other photos from the other set that I was working on. Um, although it never, I never intended to do a set full of Wes Anderson style photos. It's just this one lent itself particularly to it. It's particularly when, especially when what I did was I took the saturation and I really ramped up the saturation in this photo. And suddenly you had these kind of oversaturated pastels. And along with the fact that all the action was happening dead in the middle, and the fact that it was looking flat on to the image kind of gave it a bit of a Wes Anderson style feel to it. So that's what we investigated back then. Um, but this is Annalise and Phil again. And um, so, but like I say, this, this photo was the sort of exception to the set that we did. So we were at Air, which is um, on the kind of east coast of, no, west sort of coast of Scotland or sort of west of Glasgow, really. Um, it's not over kind of Highlands Way. If look it up on a map, you'll find it. Go to Google Maps, look up Air A Y R, a bit like the first half of my surname, um, and you'll find it. Anyway, so there's a beach there as well, and this is the sea wall. So we did a set of photos there, and the main thing about this was where um, the you know the the other set of photos I did were um, kind of an intensely emotional gripping kind of stuff and then this one was very kind of light whimsical um uh, sort of Wes Anderson style photo what I really wanted to do was um so I just realized I've got a whole bunch of photos set up there that I don't really want can I there's an option here somewhere for getting rid of this lot down at the bottom so I, um Microsoft has obviously updated its nope I'm going to come back to that that's not what I wanted to do Okay, it's updated its system and now gives me a whole pile of things down here. There is a way to switch it all off, but um, can't remember what it is. Um, right, so what was I saying? Yes, so okay, let's 
spring back here for a moment. I'll close that. And, uh, oh, I can see John's joined us saying uh, good day from Ohio. Oh, Lisa's joined us and says hello from Madrid as well. Been a little while since we last saw you from Madrid, Lisa. Welcome back. Um, Meg says hello. Great to see you all here just now. And Rosemary's also joined us. Say good morning from the way too productive gardens of the Pacific Northwest. Very productive gardens, I suppose. Are we at that season? Are we coming? I suppose we are really at that kind of a late summer now where all the produce is starting to find itself, find its way. I do have to say we've been brambling in our garden little kind of tangent here uh, so brambles or blackberries uh, when I grew up down in sort of South Wales and southern England uh, the fruit is the blackberry and the prickly part plant was known as the brambles but since I came up to here to Scotland I've discovered that the the plant uh, sorry the fruit is called the bramble and the plant is called the briar so uh, anyway so we um, we have a quite a few briars in the garden and uh, for the last nearly two weeks now every single day I've gone out with a little yogurt tub and managed to pretty much fill it with with fresh brambles which is fantastic um, yes and uh, part of that is uh, part of the treat is Maggie at Christmas then makes bramble ice cream which is absolutely to die for and also between now and Christmas hoping to get a good bramble crumble as well so well worth um, well worth going out and picking and trying out these things. Uh, oh, in Marilyn also says, good morning uh, slash afternoon from sunny Denver. Welcome, Marilyn. OK, so, right, let's return then. Where was I? Um, so, cinematic, uh, cinematic ideas. So, yes, where were we? So, what I wanted to do with Annalise and Phil. So, to show you, we had this photo here and... Sorry, I just I, there, I know something came up earlier for how to actually get rid of these bits at the bottom, and I can't see how to. If I right click there, is there an option there to just hide film strip? Woohoo! That's what I wanted to do. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. Distracted. Felt I couldn't kind of carry on with that. Um, so where was it? Yes. Yeah, so this this then was the oversaturated version. This was the original version. Oh God, it's giving me the bloody film strip again. Um, so this was the original version, um, unedited. Um, so you can kind of see how much the saturation went up. But what I decided to do was I decided to give it a different kind of feel again. And, um, right, where did that one go? Open, yeah, here we go. And this one, has it's it's got that slightly more desaturated feel to it again hide film strip there's got to be a way of just turning that off automatically anyway i'll worry about that next between now and next week <laughs> um but it's got a sort of slight kind of it's sort of slightly desaturated but it's also got a sort of slight color tints to it as well and so this is part of what i was going to talk about there's a notion of kind of color grading within when you're sort of doing film uh, filmic style things as well and a lot we, we touch on it all the time how, whenever we're doing editing you're picking a particular color palette but also how much you're deciding that you if you're trying to create a set of photos where every photo in the set feels like they're joined even if the photos are quite different if the color tones and grading are the same and the crop is the same then they feel like part of the same set and so that's a kind of really important thing to understand if you're ever going to do a set of photos here. Um, so to give examples then, um, so to, or to show you some of the other photos then. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll go through the set of photos and then I'll actually show you what I mean about the color grade. Or will I do it the other way around? Let's do it the other way around. I'll tell you what, um, no, nope, not that one. Just to show you actually, that was a photo taken of me on their phone while I was doing some of these photos. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so what do I want to do? I want to go back to this one, so the original. And if I open this in Photoshop, and I'll kind of show you the kind of thing that I, I was doing. So we've got the photo here. And what I decided to do um, was, if I go to Hue Saturation, and I kind of desaturate it by about 50% thereabouts then you can see I've knocked most of the color out of it. However, I don't want all of the color knocked out of it. What I was, what I do like here is I like Annalise's blue hair and I like her pink coat. Um, and even a bit 
Uh, although I don't want that over sort of stronger kind of yellowy brown of Phil's jacket. Maybe I want a little bit more of that in. So what I could do here then is if I just kind of, I'll do this very kind of quickly and roughly, but if I select Annalise here, um, let's take that bit out because I don't want to select the sky there, and then I'll select um, Phil as well and just this kind of top part of the jacket. Um, and then uh, masking, using the mask here, I go to the black, I take the paintbrush, take that to 100% and then paint this back in. And you can see what we've done is we've painted just the colours of them and not everything else around them. Uh, then what I want to do, I don't want that yellow quite as strong, so I take that down, you know, maybe take that down 60% or something like that, inverse, and just kind of take some of that colour out as well. Now I can deselect that. And then what I also did with this was, what's going on there, um, was I put, brought in a little bit more in the sky. So again, maybe it's sort of something like 60-70% um, with the mask. Uh, go cancel that, wrong button, that one, and just very slightly kind of bring a little bit of the top part of the sky back in. And so that gives us then this sort of slight sense of what I was I was doing before. So then if I just check the levels, I can see they're a little bit low down here. So I click that and just drag that up to about there. And now we've got something that's a little, you know, is, is edited to the point that I want. So by desaturating, we're part of the, part of the feel for this, and you'll see it more with some of the other photos, is that it was the tail end of winter. I mean, we're kind of officially into spring, but considering it, air is a tourist town, so some of the places have started opening up. They'd opened up for Easter, Easter's passed, summer isn't here yet, and there's a very particular quality to um, seaside towns that are not full of tourists. Um, and I wanted this sort of sense of that's very slight kind of bleakness that you get. And so that's why the kind of desaturating became important. I didn't want the bright colours of, of, of summer. I wanted to kind of have a, sh a, a kind of more desaturated, a kind of pulled back sense of that kind of sort of slight bleakness uh, inhabiting it. But within that, there's a wonderful warmth between Annalise and Phil. So I wanted the colour still to be in them, if not the surroundings. So... It's not just a case of randomly moving sliders about. It's a case of deciding what's the narrative. Now, as I always say, what's the story? What is it you're trying to tell? And then what can you do with the editing that is going to enhance that narrative? So with this idea of the narrative, this was the way I decided to enhance it. But then, so I've got that to an extent, but then what I wanted to do was play around with this notion of color grading that I said. So if I select all that, copy and paste, so I've got all this now on a separate layer. Then what you can do is there's a whole bunch. Now, you can, if you want to, you can go in and individually customize all sorts of things. But within Camera Raw, and you can get all sorts of other things here, as uh, other programs which do all this. If I click here, there's a whole bunch of presets, which of options here, and adaptive portrait. So let's say adaptive sky. So then what it does here is it automatically pulls out the sky and it gives us dark drama, neon storm. So it's giving us different styles of sky if I wanted to do that. There's adaptions for portraits for seasons, so different kind of spring seasons. And you can see some of these start to look really quite retro. Some of these look like old um, film camera style. You've got vintage ones here as well, which there's some quite nice ones kicking up. quite like that. You know, that's quite an interesting one too. And so you, there's a lot, you or futuristic, there's a lot here that you can go around and play with. There's different black and white styles, all sorts of things you can go with. Anyway, having gone through dozens, if not hundreds of these, eventually with this, I just settled on VCR 02, Video Creative um, 02, and I click on that. But it's just a little bit overkill with that. So I then take that back off and then start nudging it back in until I kind of get to a point where I go, oh, OK, yeah, I kind of like that. So probably somewhere between sort of 40 and 50 percent, something like that. And now it's just giving us that slight. You can see if I click on and off, 
is sort of warming some tones, but it's still keeping other ones um, slightly desaturated. And then that then ends up giving me the kind of feel that I want. So then if we go back to this, you can now see how we've got these tones running into the photo. And then of course the last thing I needed to do was crop this down to that more cinematic crop, which I mean, I can go, go ahead and get it exact, but just for the sake of it, giving us this sort of, you know, that's more or less the crop there. So when we go back to here then, and we fill the screen, you can see then that, so it is slightly desaturated, but then it's got this sort of slight color grading to it. Um, and I think that that really kind of makes it interesting. A um, couple more, I can see here. Uh, a couple more comments have come in. Um, what are, oh, Janet's joined us from Ontario. And uh, Rosemary says, um, oh, <laughs> in reference to homemade bramble ice cream, sounds amazing. Um, oh, uh, and from Texas has also joined us, just says good morning from Dallas. And April says hello from a sunny, warm Long Island, New York. Um, so, yeah, I well, little, something I'm just trying out here. I don't know whether it'll work. I've actually, rather than kind of constantly flipping backwards and forwards, on my own screen here. Um, I have set up my tablet down to the right of me just to see if I can feedback and see the comments that are going on at the same time. Um, oh yeah, so I can just see Maggie's just joined it. It says it shows the importance of knowing your narrative in order to settle on the best settings. That's a really good point, Maggie, and it, it is. It's, it, I constantly talk about this notion of the importance of the narrative. What is the photo about? What story are you trying to tell? And it doesn't have to be war and peace. It doesn't have to be anything really big, long, dramatic and drawn out. It can just be a fleeting feeling. It could, if you could sum it up in a single word or just a short sentence, then, but it's that notion of when you, as I've said before, every time you bring the camera to your eye, there's a reason you brought it to your eye. There's something about that, whatever it is in front of you, that's caught your attention and you somehow want to capture that and then convey that idea to whoever sees that photo in the future. Now, it might just be to convey it back to you. It's that's interesting. You want to capture it for your own memory. But as all photographers and budding photographers, we mostly take our photos with the idea that we're going to show them somewhere as well. We're going to show them to other people, in which case understanding what it is we're trying to convey is a really important part of what we're doing. So, you know, it might be a case of there's something about that splash of yellow against the green, which is really capturing my eye. Well, now I know that. How do I angle the camera? What settings do I put on the camera? What do I do to enhance that feeling that I'm getting from that little splash of yellow? Do I need to be closer in so the yellow takes up more of the space? Or do I need to be further out so it's just a hint of or it just catches your eye, but without dominating the scene? So you can see that every single thing has options. You then, but once you understand the narrative, that then informs all the decisions you make next. It informs all the photographic decisions you make, but it also informs the editing decisions you make. And every single week when I do a critique or feedback session on anybody's photos, that's nearly always what we're talking about. How, what can we do with the editing that is going to enhance the narrative that's trying to be told? So let's go, let's return then to um, to the to this photo. So we've got this photo. So what I wanted to do now was I, I, I took, I think there's 11 photos in this set. And essentially then I kind of arranged them in a sort of order. So that is kind of like a mini tale. I wanted them to feel like scenes from a movie so that, you know, if you saw some of these little things and you saw coming up on Netflix soon, you know, you might be tempted to sort of tune in and watch it. We don't know really what the movie is. Um, but there's a sort of sense that it could be that there's some kind of story going on. And so this kind of ended up. So we have this, this, there was this one on the sea, on the sea wall and the next one closer up. And this is, this is another one where the cinematic crop, I think, works so well. Um, so they're still on the sea wall. I've come in close now. Um, Annalise and Phil playing, she's sticking it, sticking her tongue out. Um, we now get a much closer sense. You can see all the blue highlights in Annalise's face. You can start to see that she's got these red heart-shaped glasses, sunglasses. Uh, there's a much more character. And by coming in this close, I think there's something about the cinematic crop 
that allows you to get right in when you, it's an interesting one you know we, we've done that kind of two people in the landscape in the last photo but in this one it's intimate we are really close in if you were closer in but the edges were cropped down into a more standard kind of crop I don't think it would work quite as well. It would just feel like you were very close. Um, and if there was more space around the top, you would feel sort of sitting back a little bit more. But this, this kind of allows you to feel like you're right in there with the action, um, so to speak. Um, so I, I thought this was a fun kind of uh, photo with this one. And so next one in the series, um, Phil disappeared off for five minutes and we decided what we were going to do was going to play around with ice cream and so here we've got a classic beachside um hut kind of it's not a hut we building there where you can get your burgers and your fries and your hot dogs and your ice cream and your candy floss and coffee takeaway coffees and teas and soda and all this kind of stuff um and again it's open because the season it's um we're in the season but there's hardly anybody about outside there's this sort of giant ice cream there um so while we're waiting for phil just have a little bit of fun here and lise goes up sticks her tongue out at you like she's about to eat the giant ice cream i mean how many of us haven't thought about that i mean from where we were sort of three years old sort of being dragged to the seaside or whatever or seeing this giant ice cream just immediately imagining what would it be like if we had an ice cream that big it's fun and I thought that kind of idea of, um, you know, it just sort of worked well. It kind of translates. It, it feels very nostalgic. Um, oh, Meg says, is it a real ice cream or not? <laughs> now, unfortunately, Meg, it's not a real ice cream. I think a real ice cream that big would have melted very, very quickly. No, it's just a model of an ice cream. But I think it is that bit there where we all kind of desperately wish that it was real. Um, so that that was one. So then the next thing. So we, Annalise and I went along. We got we got a couple of ice creams while we were waiting for Phil to come and join us. And there was this lovely bit where she was standing there with the two ice creams, and she just decided to start eating one of hers. And I thought, yes, okay, right. We've got to we've got to do a, a version of this. And this is the one for um, that I've, I've used on the I use for, to promote today's podcast i think of all the photos in this set personally this is my favorite this is the this, this one feels like again there's narrative going on um well that kind of de i've done again you can tell from i've desaturated everything but i've allowed the color to come back out especially in her glasses in her hair and in the raspberry or the red whatever <laughs> pretend fruit raspberry sauce that goes on the ice cream as well so those are the colors that are standing out against a kind of slightly desaturated background and what i love about this notion of the two ice creams is that you can read it in a number of ways uh two different stories that happen in, i mean and I, I put this in somewhere once and i just called it waiting for phil so she's got two ice creams so she's she's tucking into one while she's waiting for the other person to turn up so she can hand them the ice cream another way of interpreting this is actually she's on her own and she's just decided to comfort herself with two ice creams and that gives it a completely different feel as well and if you don't actually have any of the others in the set if you're looking about a standalone photo I think this is probably why I love this photo the most. I think of all the photos in this set, this is the one where you can actually generate more narratives out of the same image. Um, but again, I think this cinematic crop, uh, so we've got, and she's not dead center in this one, we've got her slightly off to one side, we've got the line of the sea wall taking us back and drawing us at the curve of the beach as it goes round, and it's giving us a sort of real sense of place, you know? that you are really aware that this is um, a beach in, you know, in, in winter or tail end of winter. Um, OK, April said, what time of day was this? Uh, was the photo taken eating the ice? I, I mean, I think it was probably about 10, 11 o'clock. No, it would have been later than 10, possibly 11, possibly even noon. Um, but certainly after 11 o'clock in the morning, I think. Um, we went there, down there to do the shoot and um but the, that uh, you know although it was a sunny day that that desaturating 
the the colors again you know a, a kind of make it slightly more ambiguous as to necessarily the time of day or you know it could be later or earlier but it still has that sort of slightly more winter feel especially also because of course she's got you know a, a, a jacket on as well um next up for this one so this is Annalise and Phil um me looking straight down so they've now gone and sat down with their ice creams with the, with our back to uh, the sea wall. I'm now standing on the sea wall, pretty much exactly where Annalise and Phil were in the first time, and only I'm now looking down, straight down, on top of them. And there's something fun about this. Now, just, uh, you know, this brings me into reminder of the, um, the fact that next week we're, we're running a looking down uh, challenge. But I'll, I'll come back to that. But but just as a kind of to keep that idea in mind that when you're kind of looking straight down from above rather than at a slight angle, it changes the mood and feel. There's a moment where for a moment you're kind of you've got to reinterpret what is it I'm actually looking at here. Um, then you notice it. Then you realise it. I mean, there's even a possibility of kind of you know, thinking, you know, does it look like they're kind of almost lying on their backs? on a tarmac or you know gravel kind of uh, ground and then with a with our feet up against a sort of sand wall you know that it's it, you realize probably that it wouldn't be the case but you know the, the the fact that the mind can sort of start interpreting it in more than one way i think is kind of fun with this um next one in the series then was i came down and was then looking um side on you know, to, so here we can see now the the the, the sea wall just disappearing down. It creates this sort of lovely leading line, and it sort of sweeps around the edge of the coast here. So we can see that we're further down from where we were. So actually, if I go back to where were we? There was that um, <laughs> this photo here, which basically Annalise took uh, from there, um, and. <laughs> get rid of film strip ah oh, hate that um and you can see she's she's caught phil's ice cream just in the corner here but this slope here that's the top of the slope is where annalise was standing when she was she held the two ice creams just above them up on top of the sea wall was where the two of them were sitting and then where i was standing looking straight down then i've come down to take my photos from this angle and you could actually sorry i just closed that a bit too quickly what i was going to say is um, open that again and does that press F yes pressing F gets rid of it great um, what you can also see here is that <laughs> I've got the remains of my ice cream in my hand here um, kind of a little bit of I mean it's really difficult trying to take a photo and hold an ice cream at the same time so um, yeah a little bit of fun um, anyway so back to here so but we can also see because Annalise started her ice cream before Phil turned it up turned up she's at the point of kind of getting she's like me at that same level of that's how much ice cream is left because we've been eating ours before Phil arrived uh, so he's still got some of his ice cream left while she's just finishing hers off but I love the way she's looking at him while he's just kind of hmm, kind of slightly lost in sort of, of the ice cream but she's kind of eyeing him up um, and again, this sort of cinematic crop allows this sort of sense of space. And actually, I saw, I, so I then had another thought. I, um, okay, so what's the little thing here? Um, so Andy says, did you have some idea of the shots you wanted before the shoot? Or did you just work with the models on the day? Well, mm, it's a little... I. What I would say with that is there are some pieces, and it's a, it's a really good point, Andy, because there are there is kind of two different schools of thought with photography, um, or rather, there's a particular school of thought which is about pre-visualization, which is about the idea that you have a really clear idea of what you want in your head at the point you go to take the photo, and then as you're taking the photo and looking in the back of the camera, you're able to match up how well whatever's in the back of the camera is matching with. The visualization that you've got and so if it isn't matching very well you kind of know where to go next now i've personally don't find pre-visualization works for me um first of all i don't get i i while i get images in my head my images aren't really clear they're always they're slightly fuzzy at best um what i tend to like having is sort of rough outline kind of thumbnail sketch a kind of loose idea as such and then 
work with what we've got. And in this case, so one of the things when we chatted beforehand, uh, we had talked about the idea of going down to the beach and this idea of um, the beach sort of in winter, even though it was the end of winter, kind of into spring. Um, but that notion of that holiday town where you don't really have many tourists, but you're still maybe wanting to eat the ice cream on the beach, even though you've got your jacket on because the sun might be out, but it's still cold. And I think there was one reference point where in bits of the discussion, kind of if you like part of the mood board, where Annalise had mentioned, um, oh, what's the movie? It's got Jim Carrey and uh, the, ah, I was about to say it and it's gone completely out of my mind. Um, something of the something mind, the, ah, nuts. Nuts, I was, I was absolutely, I was gonna say the, nope, the, I'm afraid that, <laughs> <laughs> I'm afraid the, the, the movie's gone. But anyway, there was a particular movie reference. Um, and we thought, OK, yeah, Kate Winslet was in it as well. And then Kate Winslet also has dyed hair. Um, and there's a bit where they, the, the two leads meet on a beach in winter. Um, or have both happen to be on the same beach and then kind of start chatting on a bus on the way back. Some of you, The eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. The eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. That's the one. And if anybody's seen that then it's not that we were trying to copy that in any way, but it became a sort of slight reference point, one of the reference points. Um, so uh, we knew Air Beach was quite close to where they lived. We knew we wanted to go down there. So that's really where we were coming at it from, Andy. Um, so I didn't, it wasn't that I had specific ideas in mind, but I knew that if we got down to the beach, we knew there's a beach, we know there's a sea wall, that there's going to be options to play with. And then we turn up and of course the ice cream counter is open. So we grab ice creams and then we kind of start working with that. Um, okay, so what else have we got? So Rosemary says, amazing what variety you're able to get within such a small area. The cinematic crop really alters that reality. I think the cinematic crop does. It, you know, it just changes that kind of feel of what you've got. And it's part of what I love about it. Um, uh, yes, Andy's gone, the eternal sunshine. Yeah, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind. That's the one. Um, so where were we? So, yeah, actually, having seen this one, I like this. And I thought, well, what would it be like if I went further back as well? So then I did this version, a very similar kind of version of the same shot, but it's got a very different feel. Whereas this one, we are there with Annalise and Phil having the ice cream and the background is supporting that. With this one, we just get this real sense of the sort of the large emptiness of the beach. I mean, of course, if you zoom in, you can see that there are a few people in the distance. But, you know, beyond a, a handful of people, I mean, what have we got? Maybe a dozen people at most or what's, you know, quite a large area of beach and maybe another half a dozen there. Um, you know, it's not a lot of people and around where we are, there's hardly anybody. And so this then and I love the kind of the, the way these lines give you that kind of real perspective disappearing down into um, that, that shape, that almost kind of the shape of the South African flag, these kind of the two diagonals and the, the line across um, is a really pleasing kind of composition. And it does change the feel of it. And again, that big cinematic crop width to it um, gives us a different feel. And I, I kind of had fun with that. Uh, next up, then I decided to move round and look at them straight onto the wall. Now, at this point, <laughs> what's kind of fun is the fact that, you know, uh, Annalise has now finished her ice cream and is then eyeing up Phil, Phil's ice cream. And now Phil starts feeding it to her. Um, <laughs> and he's adopted her glasses for this shot as well. And again, going for, for these ones, Rather like the way it's not trying to be Wes Anderson, but it, there is there are some of these photos where, again, I just wanted to go for that center aligned and that flat on. So it's, it's using some of those Wes Anderson things, but I'm not going for that oversaturated look. So you don't necessarily think Wes Anderson when you see this. But there are plenty of um, other directors who like to have the action in the middle as well. Um, and then another version of this is more or less the same, but moving in closer. So back here. And she's got her glasses back on. So here we're much closer in. And now we're, it's, it's more intimate again. We've kind of come closer and we can see what's going on. Phil is feeding Annalise part of his ice cream. Obviously, there's, there's such warmth between these two. 
as such they're such a lovely couple such a beautiful couple um and to be able to capture some of that as well within this kind of really added to that whole sense i think um of part of that sort of part of what the cinema the cinematic movie that it could have been um was about um then moving on to the last couple of photos going back up on top uh of the sea wall we had this idea of looking down and just sort of lying on the beach and again it gives you such a different kind of perspective you just don't normally see something like this um oh i see pat's joined us as well hi pat glad you could make it, it says they look so sweet close up um yeah they really do uh, and april says it definitely helps uh, that this uh, was done in winter or else people would be walking around would ruin the flavor of the photo well that's true i think to be honest uh, but that's yeah kind of i see what you mean uh, it, uh, interesting okay interesting thoughts here april which is Yes, if I had gone decided that these were the photos I wanted and then tried to do it in summer, you're absolutely right. It wouldn't have worked because the place would have been packed. But if I'd been doing this in summer, I wouldn't have tried to do these photos. I would have then done a different set of photos and used what was there in a very different way. Um, and I think, again, to go back to that point we were talking with, with Andy about the notion of pre-visualisation is... A lot of the fun and the creativity for me in photography is seeing what I can do with what's in front of me. I've talked before about the, that notion of it's like being given a bunch of ingredients and said, OK, you've got 20 minutes. What can you create out of these ingredients? You know, there's a daytime show on British TV called Ready, Steady, Cook, where that happens exactly. The guests turn up with a bag full of items and then the celebrity chefs have to cook something with those items and make a three course meal in 20 minutes. And there's an element of that which, where I get excited when I'm doing photography, which is I have a location, I have people, I have whatever they happen to be wearing, and I have whatever other props might be available. Now, in this case, props is maybe the, the glasses she's wearing or it's the ice creams we've bought. Um, what can I do with that now that I've got it? And that notion of changing angles, changing direction, being up on the scene wall, being down at the side, doing close up, doing wide out. Um, this is all part of the fun of the creative process for me. Um, so give me a different set of circumstances. I'm then going to have a different set of ingredients to play with. That's really what I'm trying to get to. So if I went down, if we, if I'd gone with them in the summer, first of all, they wouldn't have been wearing these coats. As you say, there would have been a different set of people. And so basically I would have created an entirely different set of photos. Um, so yeah, I hope that, I hope that all makes sense. Um, John says, uh, so many different and interesting perspectives and April says, I love it. Um, and then my final one, which I wanted to do was this one. And, um, I, and again, it's just, it's really emotional it's 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 beautiful to i mean to me at any rate just you know that idea of that kind of spooning position his, his arm tenderly around her um i like little details like just the glasses sitting on the sand here where the, the light the sunlight is going through and creating the little kind of red patch um it's just a, and then actually I, I think I cleared away in the editing, sort of took out a little candy wrapper somewhere that was just grabbing the attention and not contributing to the, the picture. Um, but this idea then of isolating, and this one I don't have the sea wall included in it. So it is just them and just the sand. And, uh, and that sort of creates its own feel to it as well. Um, so uh, that so that then is is the kind of photo. So where are, so let let me sort of run on from this then. Um, oh, I see VG's joined us. Uh, says good evening everyone. Oh, uh, well, delighted you could make it long, VG. Um, where are we? Okay, so Stacy said we have something similar called chopped, but a good analogy of photography. Um, Susan, oh right, chopped as in like for ready, steady, cook. Okay, cool. Um, Susan says I think this is my favourite so far. Um, April knows the show. Sandra says, I think the looking down shot's really effective. 
And yeah, so what I want to do then actually from this photo is run on to the idea of the challenge. So those of you who had tuned in last week, and even if you weren't, now's your chance to be reminded that next week I've set up the looking the, the from above challenge. And it's this idea completely of looking directly down 90 degrees straight down, not looking at an angle down, you know, 45 degrees, but absolutely straight down from above. And if you didn't see it or you want a reminder, go back to last week's episode, episode 165, where I run through a whole bunch of different photos to give you ideas of ways you can interpret that idea of looking down, whether you're wanting to look down a couple on a beach, um, or yeah, might be an idea if you've got permission from them or you know them, um, or whether you're looking straight down at, a, at your cup of coffee or your bowl of soup, or whether you've decided to create uh, a set of something or a little scene. I uh, saw a really interesting one the other day of a computer circuit board and the way it was lit, the side light with shadows coming out and the way it was taken from above, looked just like one of those aerial shots of a city. Um, just, you know, like when they're sort of flying over the top of New York or something, looking down and you've got all these. And this circuit board looked just like that. I was really quite impressed with that. There's, the point being is that when you are looking straight from above, it gives us a different perspective and it can be a lot of fun. And I really encourage you to have a go at doing this. If you don't have time, go raid your archives. I'm sure you'll have something in your folder. But I would suggest the idea that you try and create something for this looking down um, so, yeah, uh, from above. From above um, contest for next, uh, not contest, challenge for next week. Try and get your photos into me. Um, by Friday, the latest. Um, certainly Saturday is the very, very latest. Anything that turns up on Sunday or late Saturday, I won't be able to include. Uh, but do get your images sent to me. Um, I, earlier, the, earlier the better, to be honest. Um, it always makes my life a lot easier if I have as much of the information for me earlier in the week as I can. Um, but I hope that you will um, take the time to sort of, yeah, get involved with the from above um, uh, challenge and send me your images and then next week next Sunday we will then go through all the images that everybody sent us sent in and we'll have a look at them and hopefully inspire each other because so much of the fun part of these challenges is the fact that everybody comes at these things from a different way and guaranteed if two of or three of you all decided to take a photo of your soup at lunchtime we would still have three entirely different styles of photo and that's part of the fun so send your photos in so that we can have fun looking at them, but we can also inspire our, our peers and friends and colleagues and we can be inspired by the photos that they sent in as well. Um, what else have we got there? Um, oh, uh, uh, Meg says, I love the curve of Phil's body on the sand on the beach. Um, and... Um, April says, looking forward to seeing the photos. Yes, absolutely. Right, okay, so that that's really what I wanted to talk about with the cinematic photo. So a little reminder here that if you find these podcasts useful, entertaining, interesting, and you would like to support them in some way, then buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayers is one of the ways you can do it. Also, don't forget that I actually do have other social media that you can come at. You know, some, most of you know about the fact that I've got Facebook, um, we also have the Facebook group, Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers, which is where you can stick some of your photos for the upcoming challenge. Um, or you can email them directly to me, kim at kimayers.co.uk. Um, but I also have an Instagram feed that you can play around with as well. I think I've got Twitter up here, but to be honest, I don't think I ever really use it. YouTube, of course, you know, because you're watching it right now. Um, right. OK, so. Next thing then is what we will do. I only actually had one image sent in this week for a bit of feedback and that came from Janet. So what I want to do, let me just close some of these windows down. So I've got a slightly better um, sense of what I'm up to. Right, okay, so Janet then um sent in a couple of photos and she said here are two different edits from the same raw file which were originally shot at prince edward island in the springtime um with the uh, reflections challenge in mind i'm not sure which image i'd prefer so um janet has sent us two photos so the first one here 
is a photo of reflections. It looks like reflections of huts in water. Um, so sort of slightly abstract. We've got to take a look at it and work out what it is we're seeing. Where's that F? There we go. Um, yeah, there we go. And uh, the second photo she sent is this one where we've actually got the huts as well and the reflections. So she goes on to say, uh, so they've taken a bit, I'm not sure which image I prefer, she said. Um, so these then are the two images. You can see that here, that with this one, this is essentially the bottom part here cropped. Now, what, um, what uh, Janet did do was she sent me the raw file. And essentially, this is the original photo that she's working from. So if I um, open this in Photoshop, then what we can see here now. So what she's done is she's um, straightened it and then cropped it in. Um, and actually, let's just take a quick little check. Um, yeah, so she's just missing out the little bit of red on the edge here, um, just taking it to the edge of this hut. So not including the, the red one. And um, so the crop is sort of basically about that. And then she's included as much of the reflections as she can. So that's kind of the crop that she's gone for. The question is then is how could we, are there ways that we could have improved this narrative? And to go back to what we were talking about, which is what is it, what is the narrative here? So that's one way of doing it. And, but if we go back to the original photo here, what we're actually, so we can see what we've got. What we've got here is we've got five huts in a row and then we've got that reflection in the harbour, in the river um, or the creek or whatever it is, uh, just here as well. And what grabs your attention is these reflections. Now, the question is, is really what else might you have done with it? And I think I think that, um, first of all, uh, smoke points to you there for recognising it and then making sure that you're going to try and give it a go. I think ways of improving it, though, is that part of part of the thing that's going on here, because you're at a slight angle, you're about sort of 20 to 30 degrees off being face on. We're seeing the sort of sides of these um, and so when we kind of crop crop down, I think when you kind of come in this far, and I think you were taking out the yellow bit as well, um, it, there's not really enough in it. The, the colours of the sheds themselves, um, whilst they're kind of interesting, it actually becomes more interesting with the red one because that shows you a more variety of colour. Just having the little bit of red, because I can see what you were doing was you were cropping out this telegraph pole here. Um, but in your one, you've left a little bit of red. OK, let me close those and we look at this one again. You've left in a little bit of red, which um, kind of grabs the attention a little bit. But when we look at this, even though you've kind of enriched the colours uh, a little bit, played with the contrast a bit, I don't know that it's really being truly effective. The, the reflections, the interesting bit of the reflections are quite a distance from the huts. You've got the huts up here and right through the middle, most of, you know, the, big, the biggest chunk of this photo almost is being taken up with this broken bit of wall and the brown reflection of, of that, that kind of sort of slightly, whether it's muddy water, it's just the way the reflections are. And this, this section here isn't really as interesting as um, as the, the huts and the reflection. So if we go back to here, it's almost like what would have worked better would have been if the, um, I would say, if, if the tide was higher in. And so if we, for example, so if we, let's just copy that and paste that, and then just say we were to, imagine then that the tide was further in something like that and then we do that um, and now I think when you look at something like that the reflections feel much more attached to the uh, to, to the subject so the subject these huts here then um, 
this chunk in the middle isn't taking up too much space. It's only taking up just enough for you to realize that the reflection is there. And if you, I mean, depending on how high you want to take it, you could even take it up to there. And then it feels um, like it's about to, the water's about to spill over to the edge. But you can see that the less that you have in between, the more effective, if actually that's probably a bit too high, I would need to, but. <laughs> um, the less that you have running through the middle, the more effective the relationship between the huts and the reflections happen to be. So that's really the first thing that I would say is that when you're doing reflections, you've got to make sure that, the, that you can the, that you're trying to minimize any distractions. It is about the subject and it's about the reflection. What's getting in the way of that and what's getting in the way of this from your original is the fact that the um, the tide is too far out. And if you'd been back there when the tide was in, that would have made a difference. I think another difference is the fact that we're looking side onto these huts. And I think you, sometimes when you've got huts like this, what's kind of interesting with the shape is you would be slightly better off being directly face onto it. And then when you're face onto it, then your reflections are also going to, you're gonna create more of a sense of symmetry because your horizon will be flat at the moment because we've got this kind of you know, is slightly bigger. This hut feels bigger than this one because it's closer to us, because these are further away because of the angle you're at. And so likewise, the, you know, these reflections kind of move away. When you sort of flat onto it, the reflections are then going to be exactly the same and you're going to get much more in the way of a sort of symmetry to it, which I think would be quite pleasing with something like this. The other alternative is if you're then sort of much further back or further out and you're getting a long sense of, in which case what you really need is a lot more huts. Let me give you a couple of examples of what I mean. Okay, let's take a quick look. There's a couple of um, comments here. First of all, before I move on to that then. Um, so John says, my preference would be the second photo with the huts, I think is more interesting. Um, April says, looks much better like that with the cement now hidden. Um, John likes the controlling the tides, brilliant. Rosemary says, I prefer the huts included. Coming to the reflection alone makes the question if, we, um, if there were nasty distractions you were trying to cut out, which isn't necessary since there isn't clutter. Okay, so yeah, if, that's on the, if you're just purely going on the reflections. Um, and Janet said, would need a boat to shoot face on. I, I, I mean, I get it, I know. If, if you're standing on a bridge or, a, or whatever, or the way that, you know, um, uh, but this is kind of part of the problematic thing is sometimes the photo you desperately want to get, you can't get because, yeah, there's a, a sea in the way or you don't have access to the boat. But it, at that point, maybe you sort of go on a slightly different, maybe you kind of move around and go for a kind of a length that. However, at that point, you might need more huts to make it worthwhile. So the point I was going to make here is just as an example, is if I show you this sort of photo here of... Um, beach huts and now it's not a it's it's not a perfect photo i i this this was an opportunity grabbed the weather wasn't great it was overcast and um in an ideal world <laughs> in an ideal world i would it would have been great to have some sunshine some shadows um and the more the more vibrance of that the, the light with it however um the reason i pulled this photo up is not so much to say this is a fantastic photo, but but I think in terms of the straight on, it gives you that sort of sense of, I think that the, the composition, even if I haven't quite got the light right on this one, I think the composition is slightly more interesting when you've kind of got that flat on thing. And you can imagine here again, if you happen to have reflections of water underneath. Um, so if I was to open that, and in fact, actually, there's an interesting bit here, which is if I take this down and sort of pretty much double the size and I go to generative expand and I put reflections in water and then generate. Um, this is this is part of Photoshop beta's um, uh, fact that it, it can now kind of generate all sorts of artificial intelligence um, layers and levels and what have you. Now I haven't actually tried this with this so I'm just hoping, it, yeah there we go. <laughs> <laughs> Looks a bit like a, a muddy puddle. We've got four different, ver three different versions of that. Oh, that's a very clear still water. Um, this one is giving us part of the pavement as well. 
you know, I think I quite prefer, I think I prefer that one where there's like an edge of water and oh, let's see, they've, put, they've even put a little stone in the foreground here, but I quite like the fact that it's got the, um, the ripple water. But the point here, now obviously this wasn't taken like this, this, this doesn't exist. The point I'm trying to make though, is that if you are going for a reflections photo, that actually having that sort of straight on and the symmetry of the beach huts then gets reflected that same symmetry in the reflection. There's something very satisfying about the composition with that. Uh, the alternative, if you don't have that, is to have something like this, um, where you take, where, when you've got a great long line of huts, and it, where you just sort of, you then follow down the full length, so it's, it's all disappearing off into the distance. Um, and then, at, so at that point, you, you're just, angling yourself so that you can shoot down the length of the of the um of all the huts now in your case there was only five huts there so that maybe wouldn't work quite so well but what it did but that notion of the repeating pattern that's getting smaller as it moves across the screen is you know another pot uh, potential to play around with composition so all in all, then, um, I think uh, hopefully then that's given you a few ideas there, Janet, uh, that the main thing to remember when I think you're doing reflections is that you want to have as close a relationship between the subject and the reflection as you can. And if there is anything in between, it needs to be either minimized. So you're minimizing the impact of the, the so you're minimizing the impact of the gap that's in between or it becomes something which is then interesting and adds to the story itself. So like if you had, supposing there was like a little ladder going down and you had somebody climbing down it and then that was reflected in the water, then actually that gap, but you've got somebody sort of climbing down and that reflection under the water as well, then would create a, a focal point within it. But without a focal point between the reflections, which is enhancing the narrative, then you, you run into that problem. But also this idea of, I think, actually very often reflections work at their best when you are kind of straight onto it and then you've got much more of a kind of flat mirror to it as well. If you can't get that, this idea of, well, then maybe the more interesting potential here is a repeating pattern of the huts. Can you come and just, and don't worry about the reflection, but just think about the way the huts are moving down and can you get something interesting with that as they kind of disappear into a perspective. So hopefully then that gives you a few ideas to play around with, Janet. Uh, but thank you very much for sending that photo in and I hope that gives you a few ideas. Um, a couple more um, uh, comments here. Uh, uh, what have we got here? Um, uh, oh yeah, so April says, very pretty colours. I notice these huts are very popular in the UK slash Scotland area. Yeah, I mean, though they, these are beach huts. Basically, you can hire, own, rent beach huts and so if you go down to the beach a lot, you can keep your stuff in there and, you know, keep a few chairs, stuff for your picnic, even people have a kettle or, you know, um, it's, or you can go and get changed before going. So, yeah, a beach house is something of a tradition, I think, in a lot of um, UK uh, coastal towns. Um, Janet says that reminds me of a shot from Newfoundland. Uh, VG says such colourful houses, lovely colours. Um, and... As it goes further away, uh, it looks like colourful fences, yes. And Susan says, uh, Kim, are you looking for only image? Are you looking for only one image from us for the from above? Okay, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I think, um, yeah, so for the from above challenge, generally speaking with the challenges, send in one photo. If you want to see, send me, if you want, desperately want to send two, send two. Let me know which is your preference, because to a certain extent, what will happen is it kind of depends on how many people send me images. If only three of you send me images, I'll be quite welcome and quite happy to have a second one to be able to show off. <laughs> However, if I get 20 to 30 people sending in images then and everybody sent two each, then I'm never going to get through them all. Um, so send, send, send me your first image, send me a primary image and tell me which one is your primary image. So that if there's only one slot, that's the one you've got. But by all means, Susan, send me a backup if you've got another one which you think, yeah, this, this is kind of fun, I'd like that. And if there's space for it, then I'll fit that one in as well. 
Right, okay, so what else? Oh, Janet says, I think these ones were boat houses. Yeah, boat houses rather, yes. Um, they're slightly bigger than the, um, <laughs> the beach huts. <laughs> right, okay, so that brings us pretty much to an end. Thank you to Janet for uh, sending in the image. Thank you to everybody for the live chat, uh, keeping the conversation going, and the questions you ask me. You know, when Andy's asking questions like about how much you visualise or decide that you're doing in the first place, or April, even April's point, which sort of sends me off about the idea of actually I would do different sets of shots if it was in the middle of summer than in the uh, at the end of winter. I think these are all interesting. They're not really even tangents, they're just interesting parts of the whole photographic process. And given that this is called Understanding Photography with Kim Ayers, then obviously we're wanting to investigate as many of those as possible. Um, so I think, yes, um, like I say, that brings us to the end. Uh, if you've enjoyed these, if you found them interesting, enjoyable, entertaining, then buymeacoffee.com forward slash Kim Ayers is one of the ways you can support this. Another is to bring your friends along. And actually with a challenge next week, if you've got anybody who's sort of partially interested in these podcasts or, you know, it, uh, maybe actually introducing, letting them know the challenge is on, is a way of getting them involved as well. So feel free to tell your friends. Uh, right. I think that pretty much draws us to a close. Um, thank you once again to everybody who turned up and I hope you all enjoy. Well, what am I doing? That one, that's right. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your week. Cheerio.